A very good morning to everyone. My name is Karan Latyan, and I welcome you to the 18th session of the Global Law School Summit. In this session, the discussion would circle around the topic, commercialization of law, modern trends in corporate law. As part of the panel, we have with us today four distinguished scholars who are going to reflect on this topic and share their perspectives on the various dimensions of corporate law. Our first panelist is Professor Michael Adams. He is the head of School of Law, University of New England, Australia. Our second panelist is Professor Joe Hans. He's the director, E.W. Barker Center for Law and Business, University, National University of Singapore. Our third panelist is Professor Dr. Brian Horrigan, Executive Dean, Faculty of Law, Monash University, Australia. And our last finalist, uh, sorry, our last panelist is Professor Dr. Moroz Swetlana Pavlona, Dean Law School, Caspian University, Kazakhstan. Thank you so very much for being with us today. This, this session is going to run for 60 minutes, out of which our panelists would have a moderated discussion in a Q&A format for approximately 40 minutes. I have requested the panelists to restrict their responses to three to four minutes. And in the end, we would invite questions from the live audience for the panelists. I will briefly introduce the theme of this session, which would lay the foundation for the discussion to follow. Corporations are a relatively modern social innovation, but their global role in present times rivals that of national or local governments. Since the year 1600, when the English East India Company got chartered to operate as the world's first multinational corporation, corporations have proliferated across geographies and backed by technological advancement, assumed gigantic sizes. No wonder the combined market capitalization of the world's top 50 companies measured 28% of the global GDP in 2020 leapfrogging from just 4.7% in 1990. Over time, corporations have graduated from wielding just the fiscal influence and their footprints can be noticed in all the aspects of the daily lives, including the corridors of political power. Their role also stands broader now and apart from being seen as catalysts for world trade, technological innovations and job creation, they have significant social responsibilities today. With the growth of the corporations and the complexity of the operations undertaken by them, the imperative of defending the interest of its shareholders and various stakeholders become the trigger for the emergence of commercial laws. Distinct from the existing civil laws, the new stream of such niche laws constitutes the response to the never increasing challenges posed by the corporate space. Over the last few decades, aside from corporate law, we have seen the emergence of laws for specific fields like intellectual property, competition law, capital markets, and commercial arbitration, among others, symbolizing the resilience of the commercial law regime. In order to secure the best results from globalization, both soft laws and hard laws need comprehensive renovation, keeping in mind the diversity and that the domestic laws exhibit. The corporate ecosystems globally have now potent regulators in place, both for company affairs as well as capital markets. Backed by strong domestic laws and regulations, these regulators are watchdogs to ensure effective corporate governance. Besides, in, uh, institutional investors are increasingly championing shareholder activism in most countries. The consolidation of the corporate law regimes in various countries has also resulted in many positive developments in recent times. The emergence of trends like mandatory environmental, social and governance, uh, the ESG norms, and corporate climate disclosures, special purpose acquisition companies and hedge fund activism continue to affect companies globally. The COVID-19 pandemic, the social justice movement had, 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 have, have had far-reaching impacts on business and society around the world. In many ways, we are at an inflection point. Uh, corporate law tends, uh, trends vary across regions, but corporations globally are experiencing a reckoning around, the role, around their role in the society. 
So without much ado, I'm going to start with my first question, which is that it is said that diversity drives innovation and enhances employee productivity. Why do most company boards still lack diversity? How does the status in developed and developing economies differ in this regard? And while gender diversity has been accorded legal recognition in many countries, is the time ripe for extending such legal status to racial and ethnic diversity in boards as well? I would like to start the discussion with Dr. Pavlona, and I would, I would request you to share your thoughts on this topic, please. I'm starting? Yes, yes, Dr. Babrona. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, in the, when I ask um, answer all the first questions, I must to say about problem uh, in our country. Uh, and I want to say that uh, are no problems with racial or ethnic diversity in the composition of directors in the Republic of Kazakhstan. But certain gender problems still exist since, in general, men are predominantly represented on the boards of directors of Kazakhstani companies. Kazakhstan has ratified a number of international conventions, including the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of this Discrimination Against Women, segment in New York in the, on December 18. Uh, 1979, but uh, 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 but uh, according of the, the results, uh, uh, Kazakhstan of uh, 2017 ranks uh, 52 second among uh, uh, 144 countries in the gender gap index of the World Economic Forum. According to the indicator, economic participation and opportunities of women shows place according to the education attainment, uh, 48th place, health index, uh, 36th place, political advancement, uh, 93rd place. We have adopted the law of the Republic of Kazakhstan, dated December 8, um, 29, um, on state guarantees of equal rights and equal opportunities for men and women. In accordance with this law, the state ensures the uh, observance of equal partner relation between men and women in the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of uh, state power in local self-government bodies. Uh, but there are still problems because in leadership positions, in public authorities and management, as well as in private com co companies, men are predominantly present, uh, whereas in the middle level, such dominance is no longer observed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pavlona. Uh, I, I, I can see that, you know, the problem that Kazakhstan faces is quite similar to the Indian problem. And we also suffer greatly on the gender front when it comes to corporate boards. But uh, moving on, uh, because the problem is not just limited to gender uh, diversity, but also the racial diversity, I would now request Dr. Horrigan to share his views on this, on this question. Uh, Dr. Horrigan, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Um... Across the world, um, there probably is a lagging effect in both gender diversity and other forms of diversity. But with the rise of environmental, social and governance considerations, what we use as the shorthand of ESG, it's very hard to say that investors and institutional investors are looking at ESG, which will include notions of human rights, diversity and so on, and social and economic well-being, and say that's not a concern for a company and its own governance. So in responding to the rise of ESG, companies will need to confront the lagging effect. Um, from, a, from a range of diversity viewpoint, um, it's not just gender diversity. Um, and here we need to confront the issues about the best interests of a company, 
because there are matters to consider about the best interest of a company in terms of what perspectives do you need on a board and within the organisation to ensure that you've got access to the right perspectives that will open up opportunities. And the idea that a very narrow cross-section of the community sitting on a board or being employed by a company will give you the best possible results in the best interest of the company is an idea that needs to be tested because the more interests uh, that are represented that are genuinely meaningful in terms of helping to identify the interests of the company, then the more likely it is that you can seize opportunities, understand what, are, what different segments of the community require and so on. And indeed, in terms of intercultural competence, being able to um, take a multinational corporation and operate in multiple sites of operation. So the issue of the categories of diversity must broaden, and we can have a discussion about what they are beyond gender and how they work, but we, we need to relate it also to, this is not just about having interests represented. There are public policy reasons why any country might want to have diversity of various kinds represented in companies and in their leadership, but it's also about making uh, what's necessary to achieve the best interest. In terms of how you get there, there's a rise across the world of attempts to try to straddle the mandatory voluntary dichotomy by introducing diversity requirements into comply or explain corporate governance requirements. Uh, Australia and other countries are moving in that direction. That is one way, not the only way to get, get around this. We either leave it to a, a company or companies in a sector, or we mandate it. Um, so that's one way to do it where it becomes um, identified with corporate governance on a comply or explain, either do it, or if you're not gonna do it, explain why, why in your circumstances. That increases explanatory and public accountability. So that would be my take on the question of diversity. That's that's absolutely uh, uh, like you know uh, important to understand that you know if companies truly need to be a multinational, then it's not just like you know being present uh, with their corporate offices in those jurisdictions, but also to be connected to the ground. That's absolutely uh, important uh, for for companies to realize that's that's true. But moving on to uh, the Singapore, uh, the jurisdiction of Singapore, uh, uh, Professor Hans, uh, what would be your take on this question? Uh, thanks very much, Karan. Um, I think I'll say something about diversity and productivity, because I think people think diversity means that you ignore meritocracy, and you're simply throwing a dart at a targeted group of people that you want. So if you use women, for example, in a society with 100 women, I mean, you, if you're not choosing um, very strictly, using strict criteria, you could well end up with a 50th ranked woman. But I think it is properly managed diversity that creates meritocracy. As without it, you'll be scratching around for the 100th ranked man when the first and top ranked woman hasn't even been put on the board. So the status quo with only a certain kind of person in terms of gender, race, religion on the board is clearly anti-meritocratic as you'll be getting weaker and weaker candidates, uh, even if you try your best not to. So I guess that's the viewpoint that we have in Singapore, which you know, with Lee Kuan Yew has always looked at meritocracy quite strictly. I think it is a meritocratic argument uh, to have diversity. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hans. And uh, I'm fully aware that we have already heard a perspective from Australia, but that does not stop uh, me from approaching Professor Adams with respect to his take on this question. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, yes, a, a lot of the comments have been made. I mean, when we, and I think that probably the most important thing for me is the distinction between the gender question, which is clearly important. If you look at Norway and Sweden, where they have a 40% mandated uh, and the diversity question that this is broader, those educational experiences, uh, the racial background, uh, ethnicity, age, you know, all those factors. I think the research is actually quite overwhelming in terms of that diversity. Of course, they have to be high quality individuals and that there is an onus certainly on the larger corporations to make sure that the executive training or the professional training, and certainly we know in the legal profession, the accounting profession, it is pretty well 50-50 at the, certainly at the university level, but right through to partners in firms. But when we look at boards, it seems to be still a long way away from that. Um, my issue is that we have tried targets in the UK, as you know, the 30% club and that type of concept, and they really are changing what I refer to as a glacial speed. You know, we are at a point where some form of affirmative action, some sort of encouragement, but I also completely agree with the, the quality question, but it's actually making the opportunities, the experiences, uh, and also, I guess, the show, we know the showcasing of exemplars, people who 
who are outstanding uh, to give those opportunities. If you look in the public sector within Australia, so the government owned corporations, they have actually provided much more diversity than still our listed boards. And our gov the stock exchange governance principles now requires disclosure, which is, as Brian said, will help the debate along in that area. So I think we have a lot of work to do, but we are slowly moving in the right direction. Thank you, Professor Adams. Uh, so this is this is uh, true that the debate, uh, you know, that is centered around whether we need to prioritize diversity over quality or quality over diversity. I think it's it's going to go on. But uh, in my opinion, I think both of these objectives need to be like you know simultaneously. Uh, like you know, the endeavor should be to achieve them together. And uh, it's it's true uh, because in India, I remember uh, some time back, a law was passed that in a public listed company, uh, there needs to be one uh, female director appointed to the board uh, of the company. So, uh, but you know how far we have come with respect to that. You know, uh, we don't have any credible research to demonstrate, but definitely that was a welcome step in that direction. Well, uh, moving on to the second question. So, uh, the second question that I would like to uh, ask my panelists is on. Uh, the recent uh, the pandemic and the situation that has got created because of it. So uh, calamities test the resilience of corporations. As corporations adapted to life in the virtual environment, many began exploring how to permanently leverage the associated efficiencies post pandemic. Though forced by circumstances, what has been the impact of the virtual annual general meetings and board meetings on the efficiency of the companies? Have virtual annual general meetings improved shareholders' participation? Should the law evolve in order to allow for virtual meetings to be converted, uh, to be convened in the post-pandemic world as well? And uh, to begin the discussion on this question, I would request Professor Adams to take the lead. Oh, thank you, Karen. I think this is a really interesting question to ask because there's no doubt that we have seen such an acceleration of technology over the last two years, predominantly due to COVID. We are here using Zoom. You're probably aware in 2019, Zoom had about 30 million users. It was one of many products. It now has 300 million users. You'll probably remember during 2020, how literally every day there'll be an update as they would redesign everything from the leave button to the way they record to security. Now there are other competitors, um, but actually it is interesting how Zoom has sort of in a way de facto become the default with a little bit of MS Teams and I said Google Hangouts and those other products. When it came to the corporations, and I'll speak from an Australian perspective, but I think it has been replicated, the governments sort of use a bit of a knee-jerk reaction. We knew you couldn't meet in person, COVID just made the pandemic too difficult, travel was restricted, so they had to allow, in short term, the use of virtual meetings. The other area of practice, of course, is executing of documents. There was no ability to do a wet ink signature across multi-contracts, so they had to come up with other forms. And in Australia, we used our delegated legislation from our federal legislation to allow that to happen, and the various states mirrored those laws. Well, I must admit, as an academic involved in this area for 30 years, I actually jumped into the debate and said, why don't we make this permanent? You know, yes, we're taking a step forward, but this is the time to actually amend our legislation to come into the 21st century. And that now has actually finally happened. We've taken many of those um, emergency regulations to cover a situation situation and make it as a normal business. Your, your second part of your question is not just around the technology and the, the, the short term. It's like, where, where is the, um, the post-COVID norm if there's such a thing? Well, I think what it has shown is that we want to use our time efficiently and effectively. When I run a meeting, one of the great things, and I see we're not using it here, but is the live transcript. So in other words, we could have closed captions for all our words, which immediately creates a word file. Well, if you're taking minutes, that's fantastic, as well as obviously recording the record. I also think it tones some of the behavior, whereas in a live meeting, a shareholder might stand up and shout and scream and behave actually quite inappropriately. The recording in a permanent form sort of tones that down to some extent. It also enables the chat type function to record good questions, which management can then go away and investigate where a 
appropriately. So I actually think it, it opens up a wider audience. It is appropriate. And I would imagine, and again, maybe we're, we all work in universities, the hybrid model where you will have some face-to-face -face people in an appropriate venue, but then having other stakeholders, other shareholders able to use this sort of form will actually make it more interactive. And I think we will see greater engagement as we go forward. Uh, it is not a perfect solution, but it's actually a, a, a big step forward. They're, they're my initial thoughts. Absolutely, Professor Adams. And, and I, I agree with this, with this point of view, but uh, I remember the law as it is in India, uh, you know, in the board meetings, uh, there are certain matters that cannot be just discussed over audiovisual linkages. And for that, physical meetings are required to be convened. Though these uh, norms were relaxed for the COVID uh, pandemic, but I don't know going forward whether these relaxations will become more permanent. But uh, moving on to Singapore, uh, Singapore is not just a corporate hub, but it's also a preferred jurisdiction for arbitration. So uh, more than annual general meetings, uh, the live proceedings uh, in arbitration cases must have also transferred online. So what would be your take, uh, Professor Hans, on, on, this, on this issue? Uh, thanks, Karan. I'm not an expert in arbitration at all, but I was involved in some litigation involving a business trust where we appeared as experts before the Delaware courts uh, earlier this year. I think, you know, for these things, it works perfectly fine. Um, whenever you have a small setting and you're talking about a couple of people speaking and even with litigators around, the problem is when it comes to voting on a large scale. And this is where I think India is actually way ahead of Singapore because you've had postal voting and now actual online voting uh, for a long time. We, on the other hand, um, have, as, as, as with Australia, we've passed uh, emergency legislation allowing this. But what we are seeing is that technology is being used for the meetings themselves. But in terms of the AGMs of the large listed companies, they're still not using it for the votes themselves. So it's the same problem that we have with Zoom teaching. That works fine. But we're not so sure with online exams, for example, because you're worried about the, the cheating and the cooperation and so on. Uh, one thing I would say, though, is that I think the Companies Act should always be drafted in a way that is technologically neutral because we are going through the process of relooking at our act again. And there's always a danger that you prescribe things too strictly and then you can't, uh, the practitioners can't innovate, right? So we should actually allow the company's corporate constitutional articles uh, to develop technology-wise instead of waiting for the statute to always be changed. And where the statute itself is concerned, the UK Companies Act is quite remarkable because I think um, Michael talked about this, the, the, the Australian Act as well. It's quite remarkable that you can change the act itself, some parts of it, with subsidiary legislation without actually having to go through parliament. So I think for things like technology, that's something that we should really think about instead of having to change the act all the time. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Hans. Uh, Dr. Poplana, uh, I, would, I would request you to share your perspective from Kazakhstan on, on this issue. Thank you. Uh, we believe that virtual annual general meetings of shareholders are an essential requirement of our time. Currently, they are effective and a successful way to manage the company's activities. But there is one problem if absentee meetings of shareholders are retained, that the virtual meetings are un unlikely to receive proper distribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pavlana. So uh, technology, definitely, you know, it's a requirement in law that, you know, uh, the law should evolve around technology and make most use of it. But the next question is kind of going to change the direction of this whole discussion, because from the pros of, of, of technology, we are moving to the demerits of technology, which is climate change. And my next question is dealing with that. So corporate responsibility uh, with, uh, like, you know, for managing climate change, as a long term financial risk has gained traction all over the world, be it the Biden administration's rejoining the Paris Agreement or its, on, on its very first day in office on behalf uh, or half of the UK's largest businesses taking carbon net zero pledge at the recently concluded climate change conference. The pressure is real. The goals announced by a corporation, even if profitable in the wrong run, may be costly in the shorter term and corporations face pressure to defect from their pledges. How do we ensure that companies keep up to such promises? 
And I would request Dr. Horrigan uh, to break the ice with respect to this question. Thank you, Karan. There's, um, in asking the end question that you asked us, which is, well, what, how, do we, how do we ensure? What are the drivers? Um, there's at least two. One is the investment pressure. So climate change is clearly bang smack in the middle of environmental, social and governance concerns. And the more we have tools and analysts and institutional investors and individual investors and labour oriented investors and others uh, who are interested in climate change as an aspect of ESG, then we get the business and economic and investment pressure. The second lever is obviously law. Um, there have been some recent innovations in Australia on a couple of levels. One is to go back to our corporate governance standards, which are a all companies that are listed companies must comply or explain why they're not complying. Climate change is clearly an aspect of managing and disclosing risk. Secondly, there have been some innovative uh, published legal opinions that others might want to look at. Um, that's in terms of a body called the uh, Centre for Policy Development commissioned some legal opinions by a couple of leading lawyers, and they produce three opinions now, which basically say managing climate change risk and making climate change disclosures is a matter of corporate law. If companies and boards don't get the management of risk right, and if they don't get the disclosure aspects right, including disclosing or, or making misrepresentations about what they're going to do after COP26 in terms of setting uh, targets about uh, net zero emissions and so on. If you get that wrong as a board, legally, you may have a problem in terms of director's duties. If your jurisdiction has a business judgment rule, you might be disentitled from relying upon it. And you might face other liability for what's commonly now called greenwashing about climate change and other disclosures. In my view, the reasoning in those opinions, and they're publicly available on the internet from the Centre for Policy Development's website, um, in my opinion, those, the reasoning in those opinions, notwithstanding the different ways in which directors' duties and business judgments uh, are formulated in other jurisdictions, that reasoning is not confined to Australia. So I would, I would put forward the pressure from the investment and financial side and the way in which this is now very clearly part of corporate law and managing and disclosing uh, climate change-related risks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Horrigan. So I would quickly uh, uh, invite uh, Professor Hans also to share his perspective on how, you know, environmental norms and climate change is, is a real, uh, like, you know, uh, consideration for corporations across the world, especially in Singapore. Uh, thanks again, Karan. As you know, clearly Australia is um, leading the world in a lot of things with respect to directors' duties and climate change and so on. And some of what they're doing has actually come into Singapore. And one of my colleagues, Ernest Lim, uh, who's written a COP book on uh, sustainability and corporate mechanisms, is working with certain Australian and uh, UK NGOs uh, where they're looking at being more nuanced with directors' duties and trying to make some of these ideals more enforceable. So I, he's examining what it means to really act in the best interests of the company. Uh, and his arguments would be that that takes into account uh, the environment as well. However, uh, some of us believe that it is not, you can't just rely on the best interests of the company alone because it is difficult to remove um, ideas of shareholder primacy from that. And so some help must come from other directors' duties, one of which is the proper purpose rule. And that requires companies to act fairly and constitutionally. And that could form the backbone or help in forming the backbone of this whole corporate purpose concept that we see now which I think without some form of sustainable director's duties will not work. Now, what do I mean by sustainable director's duties? That means that directors must, uh, duties must be clear and varied in themselves. Derivative actions should be used to sue for corporate wrongs rather than using uh, open-ended oppression litigation. And so it's necessary for us to actually have cases that come to court where we work out the details of these things. And that, that way will help build rules uh, rather than use of some kind of uncertain discretion, which I think uh, many third world countries are still at when you look, to look at things like oppression and unfair prejudicial conduct. So I think it is about going back to looking at director's duties in more detail. Thanks.
Well, it's it's actually quite correct to uh, to say that you know when when such responsibilities are to be placed on the corporations, the directors' uh, duties need to be chalked out quite clearly, and uh, this is one problem that plagued uh, the Indian jurisdiction uh, until the 2013 because uh, the Indian corporate law did not have any uh, particular statutory provision listing out these duties, and we always relied on the common law interpretation of of the directors' duties. But even with the new law, which lists uh, certain duties, we always feel that you know directors have a little more obligation than what it's stated in the statute book. So, Professor Adams, what would be your opinion on on this on this issue? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to probably follow on from my my dean colleague uh, Brian Hurricane in the sense of the greenwash angle. In fact, uh, I've just recently written an article which was published and it's getting quite a lot of readership because of the Volkswagen scandal. I'm sure many of the people watching will be well aware the Volkswagen, uh, when it was being measured for pollution emissions out of its vehicles, basically had software running that when the governments governments around the world were doing testing, it would give one result but in real world usage basically about twice the amount of pollution was occurring. Well, the High Court of Australia, which of course is our final court of appeal, has actually just rejected an opportunity to go in front of the court to accept a $125 million, that is Australian dollars, fine, which is the largest ever imposed in this area. And basically I wrote that I believe this sent a very strong message to corporations in the way they must use Use both climate change information and obviously in that broader environmental type things. Now that doesn't solve all the issues, but I think it really does send out a message. Our regulator, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, in winning this case, really have shown their powers and their willingness. Now the fine, if you look in dollars, is much less than was paid in the US or in the EU. But of course that's around the scale and vehicles, etc. But I think it really is a, a bit of a turn point to say some of these issues corporations have taken liberties in taking things which are damaging to the environment and turning them in as if it's really good and of course the flip side of this is how can we encourage innovation what can we do and in fact I have a PhD student looking at intellectual property and a way of encouraging sharing IP on environmental benefits to help climate change to achieve so I think there's this rather than just a carbon trading market, which is obviously one mechanism, but there are other ways to solve this problem. So I think in the next few years, we will see some very interesting dynamic changes across our jurisdiction. Definitely. And, and I feel that, you know, till the time uh, considerations like climate change and environmental protection remain limited to the financial uh, scheme of things, uh, the, the dichotomy of whether to invest money uh, into uh, such innovations on a regular basis or pay a fine, like, you know, once uh, it, it, it becomes due. I mean, this has always remained, but I feel that, you know, uh, keeping these considerations more in the moral realm, like, you know, holding the corporations morally responsible, for, for such uh, innovations, I think would be would be would have a far-reaching uh, like you know implication. But but moving on, and then the next question is quite linked uh, to this question, and in fact, it's an extension of this question. Uh, India uh, introduced recently uh, a mandatory CSR regime uh, for companies uh, in the 2030. Uh, many other jurisdictions have also implemented uh, similar norms uh, on a uh, like on a comply and uh, or explain basis. Should other countries also emulate this move in their respective jurisdictions? Or can such a move usher uh, in the desired responsible capital, uh, capitalism regime? So I would, I would start with Dr. Pavlona uh, with respect to this question as to you know, how a, CH, a CSR regime is looked at uh, in, in Kazakhstan specifically. Uh, the performance of obligation by corporation, especially foreign ones, can be guaranteed only by including appropriate conditions in contracts. If the con contract uh, stipulates means of security for performance of environmental and other similar obligations, then despite uh, the uh, disadvan uh, disadvantage for companies, the companies will have to perform uh, them in order uh, to avoid responsibility for their non-performance. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Prabhuna. So uh, this this has always been uh, like you know a little confusing for me because I have always been a supporter of uh, CSR, uh, you know, being more of a like you know uh, basically a voluntary regime than a mandatory one. And and I always believe in the school of thought that you know when these comes come like you know when these activities happen on their own and the corporations really want to do it, they generate like a bigger and a better result. But we also understand that you know uh, corporations mostly are profit driven, uh, like you know uh, their uh, like you know associations, and uh, sometimes you know CSR takes a backseat. So uh, implementing it through the legal uh, uh, mandate uh, becomes the only option available to the governments. But but what would be your take on this, Dr. Horrigan, uh, with respect to CSR and its mandatory nature? The, the mandatory nature of it, or the voluntary nature, or any compromise between that, again, needs to be considered against. Um, these notions of responsible capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, compassionate, compassionate capitalism, they're all attempts to try to soften the nature, the nature of capitalism, to soften the harsher impacts that are seen from short-termism when it comes to companies uh, pursuing a short-term uh, focus upon shareholder interests, perhaps at the expense of other interests. We need to recognise that um, these strategies um, are, first of all, path, uh, path path dependent in the sense that there can be historical and social and economic conditions that need to be taken into account country by country that make it more or less palatable and necessary to do this in India versus Australia versus elsewhere. So we always must recognize that there is no one size fits all global solution here. It must properly respect local political, um, business, culture, social culture, and other conditions. But I will say this, again, we're in the realm of investor developed trends and tools and law. In terms of investors, corporate social responsibility, like environmental, social and governance considerations is now becoming mainstream in the ways we've discussed today in corporate governance and as part of a company's DNA. So whether you take the Indian solution or another solution, the idea is not to have it as an add-on, but to have it dealt with by a, com a company's corporate governance arrangements and its approach, its purpose, and it's in the DNA from the board throughout the rest of the company, opportunities, risks, and so on. From the legal point of view um, and from the regu regulatory point of view, again, there are ways in which um, other forms and standards of, re of regulation can help. So again, in many countries, um, to say that, for example, uh, it's part of the corporate governance arrangements, if you want to be listed on the securities exchange, you have to do this. Uh, and if you're not going to do this, explain why it doesn't apply to you. But again, for example, in the Australian uh, context of the corporate governance requirements for listed companies, matters of diversity, climate change, disclosure and management of social and environmental risk, corporate social responsibility and ESG are implicated in those matters. So whether we talk about investor concerns and how investors will look at a company's um, social license and its legal license and its economic license to operate, um, or whether we're looking at the legal framework within which company purposes and directors' duties and other regulatory standards kick in, like corporate governance requirements, I would argue that from all of those angles, corporate social responsibility is mainstreamed and is an absolutely vital way of, of ensuring that companies are being strategic and legally compliant and socially responsible in their approach to these matters. True, very true, Dr. Horrigan. Thank you so much. So uh, it's 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 actually uh, quite fascinating to see how corporate law has evolved and the objectives of of companies have like you know expanded from just catering to shareholders to now also catering to stakeholders and the definition of stakeholders is ever increasing. Uh, but uh, Professor Hans, I would like to take your opinion on this. Like, you know, uh, how, how do you feel that, you know, this social audit of companies uh, is, is imperative to achieve better CSR objectives? Um, yeah, well, most of us are academics here. So I guess we are on a certain spec, you know, on a certain spectrum anyway, in terms of how we believe in ideals and how important they are. But the problem with something like CSR is I don't know how you can make it more enforceable. And I was just talking to a businessman uh, yesterday who said that he has tried to do good by his employees in the last two years. He's kept them on. And what's happened now is that his competitors, who basically sacked most of the employees a year and a half ago when COVID hit, is now offering 20% more because they didn't have the costs for the last one and a half years in keeping the employees there. 
So the problem with CSR is that we're assuming that investors, the other stakeholders, employees are all in a sense, um, unfortunately they're acting rationally by looking for a job that pays them more now. And they're not gonna remember the last one and a half years where they were paid for doing very little work. So I would say that the law has its limits. I think the problem is more with the economic systems that we have in the world, because there is no competition now um, for a form of capitalism in a sense. And that becomes more extreme as vested interests take hold without any countervailing voices. So capitalism is great when there is a realistic challenge to capitalism as there was in the 50s to 80s. But as Robert Schiller says today, it has become merciless capitalism and has led to the inequalities we see today. And we are trying to address all of these things with CSR. But I think the point about governments is that they should always aim to take the middle and play off extreme ideologies against each other, both on the left and the right. I don't know if that helps in answering the question at all. Thanks. No, but 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 this this further like you know highlights the point that you know whether uh, CSR should be uh, more. Uh, I think as 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 Dr. Horrigan said that it needs to be integrated into the DNA of the company. And how do you integrate that uh, by checking a box uh, on a form that you have fulfilled the CSR responsibilities, or by actually believing in it? So the debate would be everlasting on this point until a solution is reached. But uh, this brings me uh, to the last question for the session, uh, and this is the last moderated question. And uh, the question is that shareholders empowerment and investor engagement are the hallmarks of corporate governance. Uh, what are the imp uh, impediments faced by majority shareholders in countries where concentrated shareholding structures are found? Uh, are the laws in such countries robust enough to extend protection to minority shareholders. And I would request uh, Professor Adams uh, to take a lead uh, with this one. <laughs> Thank you, Karan, for, the, for that. Um, if I may, just I just would, I actually have one insight I wanted to say. When I think of CSR and ESG, and I, then I will swing back to this question, um, I tend to think of the CSR aspect, and this piece on what, what Professor Horrigan was saying, is very much from the corporation's perspective. In other words, being a good corporate citizen in the context of, of their leadership, the board's decisions. ESG is very much from the investor end of the telescope, looking in to say, do I want to invest in the long term in things which will not do harm to the planet or those other factors? So it's a nice conceptual way of seeing the two, two sides of a coin based on a similarity but quite different. The other interesting factor, of course, is to take into account globally that if you think about it for the last 50 years, probably longer, the, the major global companies have been oil companies, you know, fuel companies, stuff that we know that have do, has done damage but has also enabled economic development. At this point in history, our two largest global companies are Apple and Microsoft, and in the last 10 years, Microsoft was, sorry, uh, uh, Apple was already a big company at a trillion US dollars. It is now worth um, two trillion dollars, but in fact, Microsoft is now worth over four trillion dollars. So that reliance on software um, doesn't have the same impact as, as others. Anyway, that was uh, some, some considerations. Now let's swing back to the other factor, which is the question around that shareholder concentration. One of the big issues in particularly common law jurisdictions, I think, and, and where we have things like statutory derivative actions, is often in, in the textbooks, in the proceedings, it all looks fairly straightforward. In reality, we know it's often the procedures and the cost orders that are actually the downfall. In other words, the minority group bringing an action against the resources of the company and the majority directors often are required to obviously under uh, to to give an underwriting in respect of the cost of litigation. So in fact, one side often has insurance, the other side has to fund it themselves, and that can be a huge deterrent. Obviously, in some jurisdictions, you do have litigation funders who are willing to take a reasonably big slice to underwrite that legal actions. In other jurisdictions, that's not allowed. So I don't think the law quite has addressed in any of our jurisdictions that particular fundamental problem. 
on. But the other side of that, of course, is shareholder activism, which does not use those traditional legal processes and are much more likely to use social media and other campaigns, uh, including obviously hurting customers and clients by, by making people feel uncomfortable around certain areas. And we have certainly seen that in Australia in a whole range of areas. So there are some tensions in this particular topic, and I don't think we have yet resolved them for the 21st century. Right. So thank, thank you so much, uh, Professor Adams, for, for that. And, and I feel, you know, uh, your comment that, you know, these, these questions have not been resolved is quite true, especially from the Indian uh, perspective, because recently we saw the biggest corporate battle that India has ever seen between uh, the, uh, the uh, Ratan Tata on one hand and Sai Smithy on the other. And that was a classic minor, minority and majority shareholder tussle that uh, laid the foundation for better uh, oppression and mismanagement laws. But, but moving on uh, to Kazakhstan, uh, uh, Dr. Pavlona, what do you feel about uh, you know, this, this minority shareholder issue and how is Kazakhstan like, you know, uh, developing its law to better deal with these issues? Since the law of the Republic of Kazakhstan, date February 1927, uh, on amendments and additions to certain legislative acts of the Republic of Kazakhstan on the protection on rights of minor, minor, minority investors, minority shareholders uh, have received proper legal protection. First of all, major and minority shareholders uh, were clearly separated. The major shareholders included a shareholder or several shareholders acting on the basis on agreement concluded between them, who uh, own 10 or more percent of the voice and shares of uh, the joint stock company. Uh, minority, minority shareholders is a shareholder who owns less than 10% of the voting shares of joint stock companies. Despite the fact that minority shareholders uh, have less powers than majority, majority shareholders, they have enough opportunities to protect their rights and legitimate interests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pavlona. And, and then this brings me uh, to a very important point. Uh, so especially in India, uh, we see that, you know, for minority shareholders to proceed against the, uh, the misadministration of the majority shareholders, you need to breach a bare minimum of like, you know, of 10% shareholding to be able to even stand before the court and uh, like, you know, agitate your concerns. So how do you how do you feel, uh, Professor Hans, like, you know, uh, are similar measures in place in Singapore as well? Or do the, does the Singaporean law like, you know, have a different take on this issue? Uh, thanks, Ingrid Karan. So just answering your question, no, we don't have any minimum shareholding hold, uh, requirement to bring a derivative action. And our statutory derivative action was actually probably the second in the world following on from uh, Canada, right? But there are countries like China, which also have these requirements that you need to have a minimum number of shares and you have to hold it for a certain amount of time before uh, you can bring an action. So these are, these are problems that you have to consider uh, going forward. But following from this story, it might just be that there are concerns with giving shareholders sometimes uh, too much protection. And I just want to put this out there for us to think about that in some countries, it might just be that they already have more protection today than creditors, right? So you've talked about the oppression rules in private companies, which are largely against the family founders. Uh, of course, the problem in listed companies is that you don't have oppression cases that usually can be brought. Um, and we normally say that minorities should simply sell if they are unhappy. But they also have class action litigation and that's growing in more and more countries, right? We're seeing more conditional fee arrangements. We're seeing more third party litigation funders. So, you know, I think shareholders and even minority shareholders are finding ways of bringing actions. And these are not derivative actions, right? These are shareholder actions where they bring in their own, uh, for, for, for themselves in their own classes. And the thing with these class actions is that they may actually favor certain shareholders like hedge funds who sue at the expense of passive investors who do not sue. So therefore I'd like to, us to really consider if in fact it's the minority or small creditors who actually need more protection today 
given the vast amounts of share buybacks and dividend payments that we're seeing around the world, we're still waiting for the UK Supreme Court's decision in BTI and Sequana to see whether creditors will be protected from these huge dividend payments that effectively ended up um, defrauding creditors, right? So La Porta, for example, says that US, Australia are very high in shareholder protection, but very low in creditor rights. And more countries, including Singapore, are moving that way because of the new restructuring rules that we have, which we are actually uh, sort of eroding creditor rights somewhat. So with COVID, with financial difficulties, we have to ask ourselves if we destabilize priority structures somewhere, will companies really have problems borrowing going forward? Thanks. Thank you, Rosanne. Dr. Huygen, uh, your, your remarks on this issue, please. Thank you. I could just add a, a slightly different take um, in terms of another thing, another thing to discuss that's relevant. When we talk about class actions and litigation funding and with shareholders, um, a couple of things that we have to confront as new realities. One is the movement towards dispute resolution in arbitration, including international arbitration, and the way in which those rules, even at the global level, are, be, are being changed to allow third parties and stakeholders to agitate interests in those kinds of dispute resolution processes. So that's, that's relevant for countries, it's relevant for investors. Um, the other thing would be that as we move into this realm of there being more protracted disputes that need resolution, of course, from a company point of view, we're talking about there could be shareholder shareholder disputes, there could be shareholder stakeholder disputes. Um, and the change of ownership and the categories of um, institutions and individuals holding shares and the different interests between different kinds of shareholders and the conflicts of interest there um, are, are again part of the complexity when we approach this issue now of in light of the change of ownership, in light of dispute resolution being not just in courts, how do we deal with that? Um, that's, that it's not just about minority uh, shareholder protection. Um, and as my colleagues have indicated, that itself is sensitive to the state of the law and the particular path dependency uh, uh, trajectory of the corporate law in each of the jurisdictions. But there are these broader concerns that are part of the ecosystem that corporate law theory, corporate law regulation and corporate law practice needs to now adjust to. Thank you so much, Dr. Hargan. That The first question that I have uh, here with me is for Dr. Horrigan. So I will not take your leave right now. So you, you, you are requested to answer an audience question wherein the, the, the audience is asking that has it become difficult for corporations to cater to their contributions towards environment and climate change consideration, the financial or economic consequences they may have faced due to the pandemic? Um, so there will be a lot of um, worthwhile evidence-based analysis to look at different jurisdictions and look at those kinds of questions. The, the issue is um, companies and their boards are looking at this from a short-term and a long-term perspective. So there is a, an obvious need, um, and I think even in the, uh, in the way in which um, India has looked at what, where can your mandatory CSR spend be located and can you, can you count um, under the Indian law what you had to spend during the pandemic versus what you might have spent in other directions. There are those kinds of questions that will arise. But from both a short-term and a long-term point of view, obviously dealing with the pandemic and the costs within a company and the impact on its operations is, is clearly something that is consistent with ordinary corporate governance and CSR. And then taking the long-term view about um, the impacts of that and what it means for the future direction of the company, as well as the climate change stuff, well, all of those things are in scope, in my view, in looking at um, what should the company be focusing upon for the interests of its members, the interests of society, the interests of the future prosperity of the company, and so on. Thank you, Dr. Oregon. Uh, the next question uh, is for you, uh, Professor Hans. Uh, the question is that how should a corporation strive to bring a practical balance between uh, corporate visions and fulfilling the need for diversity within their corporation. 
Is it easy to derail from the organization's vision in order to fulfill the need to implement such diversity into their organization? Well, thanks, uh, Karan. I'm not sure it's a legal question. I mean, the, the part that's legal, I'll try to answer. But I guess the other thing about vision, I mean, all corporations now do this vision thing and then they, they, they have their missions and so on. So that part is good to have. But how do you translate that into uh, action where these things happen, right? I think that firstly, I think Brian and, and Michael's been talking about a lot of disclosures and so on. These things are necessary, right? So even if you don't have real sanctions, the comply and explain allows people to make judgments on these companies, whether they, 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 they follow or not, right? But I would say that more than that, I think we need to scientifically look at the need for diversity as a meritocratic thing. Because as I was saying, you know, when we are down to the, the hundredth man who's of the majority race in the country, he's not gonna be very good compared to the top person who's a minority and so on. So there is something there that we have to start scouring the world again for the best people, for the best jobs. And I think um, the word diversity may be wrong. It's just meritocracy, right? How can it be that you're down to your hundredth man on the board when the first woman isn't still there? I see. That's that's that's. I think uh, that should answer the question. Thank you so much, Professor Hans. And the last question uh, for this session uh, from the audience is for you, uh, Professor Adams. And the question is that: What changes would you suggest in the field of international commercial laws and company laws in order to keep up with the new virtual or digital transition? Would these changes also ensure faster resolution of matters? Ah, that what a what a wonderful question, <laughs> and I'm not sure I really have time to do it justice. I think I'd like to pick up on Professor Hahn's comment earlier uh, uh, around the benefits of technology and making sure that the laws surrounding them, both the actual legislation and obviously the delegated legislation, is more technology neutral. I mean, as things have have got faster and quicker, and again, we can each for our jurisdiction. Um, it wasn't that long ago that we got excited about. 10 megabits a second on the internet my home has a standard with what we call the nbn on 40 to 50 i walk into the university and i actually get 400 megabits a second now at 400 you can do anything you want you know it really and we're not going to be that far away from a thousand megabits a second now that opens up moral questions around haves and have nots those with easy access to technology the de developing world you know how can we support um even the use of satellites for technology so there's there's some interesting aspects there but i really do think um the availability of information in fact i was recently um giving a presentation for the 25th anniversary of the coventry law journal uh which i happen to be a visiting professor there and we were looking at the impact of comparative legal scholarship now coming out of the uk they were looking at um reflections around the eu law and of course because because of brexit they're <laughs> they're re-evaluating a lot of that but here we are across a number of jurisdictions and when I first started as an academic, and I have to say my thesis was done on a typewriter and, and we had microfiche and, and of course now our students, when they're doing their PhDs, it's a click here and a click there. They can instantaneously translate documents. There is greater access. There's official science giving us access to legislation, the latest case law. So I think there is actually a period of time and particularly in the area of governance, if you're sitting on a board, um, so in, in Australia, the majority of the large companies, their, their headquarters will be in Sydney or Melbourne to some extent in Perth. But when it comes down, it's really and Sydney to Melbourne is about an hour and 20 flight time and directors prior to COVID would be sitting, living in Sydney, go down to Melbourne for a board meeting, and they would say something along the lines of, oh, when I was at X company, which I'm on the board, we did this and that. And then there would be this very personalized cross seeding of ideas and concepts and challenges across the legal divide. What we're now finding is that boards with good director training, and obviously we are educating lawyers in a particular way, that they won't just be looking at Sydney and Melbourne. They will be looking at best practice in Singapore, in Pakistan, in India, in, you know, that the world becomes much more available. Now, there's a time lag, and I think COVID has really shown the sharing of scientific information in a rapid way. I mean, I don't know about you, but the AstraZeneca 
vaccine in particular, two billion people have used it worldwide. You know, that is more data than we've probably ever had on any medical treatment. And I know the lab that creates it in India is actually an absolute world class facility. And we know that because of the other things they have done. In my generation, things like polio were a problem. And now we're having second onset polio. But again, the difference is the data, the information is now rapidly available. So I think laws are definitely being impacted by that transferring of technology and available of transparency of information. I hope that goes some way to answering part of that question. I'm sure, I'm sure, Professor Adams. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more with that. But but this concludes our session. And I can't thank you all enough for sparing time and being available for this session. It was truly uh, an enriching experience for me. And I'm sure our audience was also equally engaged in our discussion. Mm -hmm.